Welcome back to the observatory. Uh, I'm Kyle Kerwin from Big Eye, and today we're going to be chatting with Boris Jabez, the founder and CEO of Census, which is a reverse ETL platform. Uh, Boris, great to have you on the show. Thanks for being here today. I'm delighted to be here. Nice to see you, Kyle. Uh, you as well. Um, so, I mean, Boris, uh, we obviously go back a little ways. Uh, where do we start? Um, I think maybe like an easy place to start is what is reverse ETL uh, in, in your own words? Sure. It's a, I always like to joke that it's a technically a bit of a misnomer, but because uh, uh, the concept of ETL is about moving you know, data, extracting it, transforming it, and loading it, as people say, uh, and it has no real direction. But uh, uh, what reverse ETL is, is the ability to take data from data warehouse or database, uh, specifically modern kind of cloud data warehouses, and publish the data, federate the data out into tools where people do their work. So traditionally, I think, you know, BI and data teams would present their, their work in a dashboard, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, with a product like ours, you can actually take the insights you're building, the metrics you've developed, and push them into products like Salesforce or Marketo and change the kind of work that people do in in those tools. So you're, you're directly impacting the sales and marketing and support teams. Uh, and so that's reverse ETL. So uh, Boris, how did, how did you realize that this was like a need in the market? And, and I think, uh, I mean, like one thing that like, I'm curious about is did, did you call it reverse ETL? Like how did, how did this kind of come about? <laughs> so, uh, we started census in 2018 and, uh, the way I had experienced it was, was seeing the company I'd worked at prior, um, we had a team, our team was in San Francisco, and then there was a bunch of sales and marketing people in Boston. And it often felt like we couldn't communicate well. They didn't seem to know what our users were doing. We had a self-serve product, right? So all of our users were self-serve. We had all this data about them. But for us on the kind of, let's call it product team, it was really easy for us to understand everything that they were doing. And then the sales and marketing team were sending them kind of generic messages. They didn't seem to know. It was always like, can you, they would ask my team, and I, sadly, I interpreted the problem to be cultural. Like, oh, they're from Boston. They don't know. Like, they're, they're from another kind of company. They're, they're this acquisition. And so if you're a salesperson, you have, you know, you wake up in the morning and you have a lot to do in, you know, your tool like Salesforce. Uh, same for marketing and whatever tools that you're using. And we really needed to bring the data to them that we all had locked away in our product kind of stack and analytics stack. So that's where it was born out of. And then as we started, so in 2018, we started you know, working with a couple of customers on this. Uh, and it's obvious that there's a pattern of companies for whom this, is, this was already a problem back then, which was companies who ship software as, as their main product and generate a lot of data about their users, ideally because they have a free tier or you know, kind of a self-service capability. And then they were just drowning in information that was not being distilled down to the, the teams where you, know, you could do better marketing, better sales, better support, et cetera. So that's kind of how we got our first couple of customers. Our first one was a Figma, which is a pretty well-known company now. I want every team, every employee to be able to use whatever app they want. Uh, and the, the hindrance to that is, is data federation, right? If every app is its own little island, you'll always be stuck in this question of like, do I have the most trustworthy data? Do I have the data? How do I go get it? And it's hard to deploy that. And so that was why we called the product census because it was the idea of having one, one count of things, right? one version of, of the data that you can somehow get into the hands of every person and every application. The, the product you know, would take any query, any model, any table in your warehouse and push it into Salesforce. Right? That was our first version. The way our first few users interpreted this, like the easy shorthand that they used to, 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 to kind of when they were deploying this was, oh, it's like reverse Fivetran, uh, which that actually makes perfect sense, right? Because Fivetran was a tool that exclusively brought data down into a warehouse, and we were a tool that pushed data out of a warehouse. And, and that over the next year, um, as more people discovered census, got morphed into reverse ETL uh, by a variety of people. Have you ever heard it called reverse ELT? Has that happened yet? I mean, I've seen someone tweet that once and go, wait, that doesn't make sense. Uh, so so uh, people have joked around with that, but no, it has not taken off. Uh, 
I'm not even sure ELT has taken off as much as we had hoped as a colloquial term, right? I think in our industry, we know. Uh, but I think ETL still remains the kind of fairly generic word uh, for this. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I mean, so uh, Igor and I, I, you know, my co-founder here at Big Guy, we used to go for coffee pretty regularly when we worked on the data team at Uber. And I still remember uh, him telling me that, hey, you, you know that what we do here is not actually ETL, right? And I was like, well, what do you mean it's not ETL? Like, that's that's what it is. And he's like, no, technically, we're loading the data in and then all, all the transforms are happening inside right. the warehouse. Uh, right. And that was like, that was mind blowing to me. I'd only ever heard it called ETL. I knew what we did and I understood, you know, that the transformations were happening, you know, in warehouse, but it had not occurred to me at that point um, that it could be done a different way, that the transforms could happen in flight. I mean, if we want to get a tiny bit nerdy, I wonder if the better you know way to think about on, census right? is T-E-L. Um, because the whole, the transition from ELT, uh, from ETL to ELT, in, let's call it in the data ingestion space, is this idea that the, the transformation logic should not live in the wires, it should live in the hub. And the reason we could do that, right, that transition, is not just because great software tools emerged to do it, it's that it became cost effective and technologically possible to do all your transformations in a warehouse because we have these infinite storage and scale. But it used to not be the case. So you needed to kind of transform in transit. Otherwise, you would just overwhelm your, your systems, right? And so census is the same premise. The, the, I don't think when, you, when it comes to data integration, people have been doing that for decades, even outside the data world, right? People have been connecting app to app for a very long time. And my point of view is, you should not put much logic in the wires, in the connector. It should be mostly in the, in the hubs. And so you could argue that census is really T-E-L, right? It's it, ELT, right, brings in the data, and then that T is shared. And this is where you transform your data, you clean your data, you create models that are useful for the business, that are not just the raw data, and then extract that out of the warehouse and load it into destination application. I, I want to change it, uh, the focus a little bit here. So, like, I uh, very often the beneficiary of reverse ETL is somebody who's trying to consume the data and do something with it yeah. in their in their line of work, right? How do you think reverse ETL changes things for the people that are in data engineering or who are on the data platform team? They're not necessarily the ones that are receiving the data after it gets loaded into you know Salesforce. They're sort of on the the beginning right. end of that journey. Right. How does this change things for them? Right. Um, I think. Everything kind of effectively, everything rolls downhill, right? So the, if I think of the traditional analytics, right? So if you're doing, let's, yeah, let's call it traditional analytics. So you're, 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 you still have a data refinery process, right? You're loading data in, you're cleaning it, you're modeling it, and then you're presenting it in a chart in your BI tool. And potentially someone is building that chart themselves. Then in that, in that workflow, your data engineering team is, is still affected by random charts that people make in one of two ways, right? One is the data is wrong because something broke along the way, right? Whether that's a cleanup process or like we've made a modeling mistake or like data is stale or whatever. Or pressure on the system has increased, yeah? I think those are the two ways I would say that even in traditional BI, like your data engineering team is in the path. So suddenly there's a report that is just dramatically more expensive to compute, the warehouse is falling down, you're causing other queries to fall down. And, you know, you, you, by democratizing the data, you've actually changed your, your workload and you got to figure out how to uh, uh, diagnose that and, and fix it. So when you think about what happens when you, you use census and you're pushing data all the way through to a, to, a, to a system where people are taking action or operating the business, is what we like to call operational analytics, right? As opposed to traditional analytics. The effect that has on data engineers is, is first, it increases the number of consumers of data. So there's only so many humans who go oh, look at a dashboard. With data being pushed all the way into an operational system, there are more people who are dependent. So just the general pressure to get the data right goes up. And that hits everyone downstream, right? So the analytics uh, uh, people have to be better, the analytics engineers have to be better, and the data engineers have to be better at making sure data is in good shape. Um, so that's the, I would say, the first big difference. 
Two, there's a subtle thing where it's like you might discover that when you push data all the way through, when your output is not a picture, but it's actually the data points themselves, there are certain things you have to think about now in terms of the data types. <laughs> so, you know, how you're storing time may not matter if your resolution, if your output is a picture, but if your data doesn't have time zones and you're pushing it all the way down to a system like a marketing tool, it's going to cause problems because they will make wrong interpretations of that data. So, so it actually pushes you to be more precise in your data, I would say. Uh, and then finally, uh, everyone's favorite thing, the, the latency requirements increase <laughs> over time. Not immediately. Like A lot of people sync data using census on a daily basis. So it's, it's very, you know, it's, it doesn't actually create new pressure on the data engineering team. It's just, hey, once a day, we push some data into, uh, into our sales tools. But the more people have access to this tool and the more they think in terms of operationalizing their analytics rather than just visualizing their analytics, the more people want lower latency. I think inevitably, data organizations are going to be pushed to go from the data is correct on a 24-hour basis down to 12, 6, 1, and less. I, I mean, I, I think a lot of people are probably hoping to hear that it makes life easier. Uh, and Oops. It, it almost, almost sounds like it's going the other way. So I would say two things. One, it means your data team is more in demand. <laughs> and so, so you have to, yeah, you either we're going to work harder or smarter, but you're going to have to do something because like more people depend on the data, which I think is the goal of any person in a company is to be more crucial, more, you know, more leverage. So, so I think of that as, it's the good kind of pressure, but yes, it increases the, 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 the work. The, the thing that it solves for you is that you, we, you, know, you don't have to figure out how to move data into Salesforce. Like, <laughs> like if you're in data in the first place, it's because you probably see how important it is or how valuable it could be. You want to do a great job in your role so that your organization can put that data to work. And I think that that's why a lot of people, I mean, I, for me, for sure, that's you know, why they got into working in data engineering in the first place. Yeah, yeah. And you know, we th I, there's almost like three three personas that, that that are in this this workflow, right? There's the data engineers and infrastructure uh, folks in the data world. Then there's the let's call it analysts, analytics engineers, etc. And then there's the operators who are receiving the data and trying to automate the business using that data, right? In in the census kind of flow, and they had a realization that didn't hit them right away. I had, it really threw me for a loop at first. And then I realized this is actually a good thing, which is that they expressed fear, like legitimate fear, which is not at first what you want to engender through your product. <laughs> like I didn't get into the, you know, I didn't get into you know, the business of making software to scare people. But the fear came from realizing the amount of power they had and the effect that they could have on downstream systems. So in this particular case, their job had shifted thanks to our product, from providing data in dashboards to taking over the entire data that lives in their email marketing tool. So, so the entire email marketing tool was now driven one-to-one -one from queries in their warehouse. And that was super cool, right? The data got clean. It was great. Super excited. And then this realization hit where if they make one mistake in their query now, the effect is a million not exaggerating, like a million bad emails go out. And so it was this, that, that hit them as this, this realization that, oh, I'm playing with live ammo in a way that I never had before. That the downsides before were, it's a bad presentation. Like in the board meeting, it's bad, which is, you know, it's its, its own kind of bad, but it's not the same. And, and so at first I was like, well, I didn't want my product to scare you. But in reality, this is good. This is, it means you're accumulating, you know, you're, you're taking on more responsibility. That's a good thing. And now our job and a lot of what we've built over the last couple of years is, is to try to provide as many, you know, guardrails as possible to help you, you know, not screw up. But, you know, you and Igor love to talk about this idea that that, that is also an impossibility, right? Anyone who's never screwed up is like never, is not doing anything interesting with data. Yeah, so I, I think you you touched on something uh, important there, right? Which is the changes uh, in in your data model, in your pipelines, and your transformations. Like that is where the company is getting value from. But those changes are also like they incur risk, right? Every time you move a piece, like you potentially break something. Yeah. Um, so I uh, I wanted to 
unpack something slightly before we move on to the three rapid fire questions. You touched on being in the line of fire um, and you mentioned the board meeting. So the board meeting made me think of the, I, I used to help sort of prepare data f- prior to one of these sort of big offline presentations. And so you would have a few hours to sit down review the data, like make sure everything looks good, you know, really thoroughly vet it before, you know, like your your hypothetical board meeting there. But in a case enabled by census, like that is literally taken away. That job is going to run in the middle of the night. Those million emails are going to send out, uh, get sent out. So it's not just the impact of the use case. It's the fact that it is now, you know, it's not real time, um, yep. but it is automated or it's yep. recurring. It's not sitting there. It doesn't have a human gate anymore. Um, and I think those two pieces are, you know, they're both kind of happening simultaneously, but they are distinct uh, sort of problems that both raise the stakes for data teams. So much of what's happening in our field is, has parallels from the the, the, the 50 years of software development, right? And the, 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 the art of it is, of course, to extract what was what is useful and, 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 and bring it in. But, you know, applications used to be tested fairly manually. And then we started to build automated testing for software. Uh, and without which we wouldn't have scaled to where we are today, right? And if anything, now the pendulum is swung the other way in software where, you know, We've realized we've, we you can test it like crazy in an automated fashion, but that doesn't really ensure that like hey this user interaction is still good. So there's there's still a need for humans in the loop. Uh, uh, we haven't really taken that away. Uh, but yeah, I think data teams that deploy census, the, the you just have to start investing in uh, automated ways to 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 catch you know catastrophic failures, and it's not a guarantee, of course, right? But that's the that's the work I see our customers doing, and we do what we can to to catch the things that that are that our system can 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 find for you. Yeah, you know, it's it's always nice to have those things as uh, as long as you can you know make the tool do what you need. At the end of the day, I think everybody right. likes having a guardrail. Uh, so Boris, uh, I, I really love talking uh, in, in depth with you about uh, about these things. We could go on for a while, but I do have three rapid fire okay. questions for you that I think should be fun. Uh, so number one, um, when you want to read something interesting, where do you go? Yeah, I'll give my out of left field answer. Um, I spend all day, most days, you know, reading technical websites, the same websites that most people in software go to, and I think that's not an interesting answer. Um, the place I go to for unusual reading, uh, in the and I, I don't mean novels, right, is a website called AL Daily, uh, Arts and Letters Daily, uh, which is a kind of aggregator of interesting arts and literature uh, uh, um, articles. Uh, and so it's a it's a total breath of fresh air from you know let's say the news streams that I'd say we probably both consume. <laughs> I was hoping you weren't you weren't going to take the easy way out and say hacker right. news. Uh, so right. yeah, I'm glad. I'm yeah. Glad. Okay. Great. Great. Cool. Okay. Number two. Uh, what is one thing? And this is not specific to reverse CTL, but let's let's go a little broader to data in general. What do you think is one thing that people get wrong about the data field uh, that you really wish that they did not? The biggest frustration and misrepresentation that annoys me is that they are their own domain rather than something that affects and represents and should cross-cut the entire business. It's like data to me is, the, is fundamental and the data team should have a company-wide perspective. And I feel like they get shunted off into like, oh, this is like for product analytics like stuff. And it's like that, that I think really bugs me. And, and, and that's why I've always been almost like, I would say jealous of the kinds of companies that you've worked at where it's, it's clearly a, this, the, the data organization is, a, is, is, is you know, for the whole company and it, it tracks to the whole company. I think uh, another good example is maybe recruiting, right? Uh, every single person that works at Pick Your Company, they had to get there somehow. So That's a good point. Uh, question number three, um, and this one is unique to Census. Uh, what is the hardest thing about making Census work that you're able to share? The naive answer is the, the, that there is no... There's no like no limit, no end in sight for how bad uh, you know APIs can be, and and how much you have to deal with with that uh, in our platform. So the thing that we want to completely abstract is 
is actually unbelievably you know difficult. Uh, whether that's uh, you know I'll give you my favorite example uh, so people can kind of get the sense of it is the you you often think about APIs as like oh well there's a rate limit and just you know make sure you're you know <laughs> you just hit the right rate limit and and the goal of sense is to be as fast as possible right um, but actually there's so much let's call it behavior that is not specified that you have to uncover by by just experience. And an example would be that there's an application, one of our integrations, we tend to stitch the data. So we, we batch the data. So if you have a, a million rows and the system can only receive, let's say, 10,000 rows at a time, we'll package 10,000 rows, ship them across, ship the next 10,000 rows, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we can do that in parallel, obviously. Um, and you uncovered that one of these applications, it, it actually could take, let's say, only so many rows, but also so many columns. And, you know, this is a product that could have, let's say, a thousand columns uh, on, on, on these rows. And, and so you have to stitch the data in two dimensions. <laughs> so, you know, we have to sync, let's say, the 10,000 rows with 500 columns and then the next, the same 10,000 rows with the next 500 columns. <laughs> because otherwise the system falls down. And, and it's like, these are not specified in the system, right? This is not like part of the API surface. You just have to kind of discover these failure modes. It's still the bread and butter of senses is to, to, to build these kind of connectors in a way that is completely seamless. Um, and I would say that, that that's still probably the, the where a lot of the most painful problems occur, but we're also the ones that we're most used to. So it's one of those where we, we've learned to pattern match really, really well. Uh, and, and we've built a lot of tooling to, to kind of make that, you know, to, to paper over those things as much as possible. And so I think over time, that will no longer be the hardest problem in census, but I think it's still the fundamental, you know, piece. It's like, hey, you have no idea how, some, how hard it is to build some of these connectors sometimes. That sounds like some pretty hard fought uh, knowledge. Um, well, Boris, thanks for chatting with me today. Um, if you want to learn more about Census, uh, the link is going to be down below in the description. I think we'll also add a link to uh, Arts and Letters. Uh, I think that plenty of people will want to check that one out as well. Cool. Um, Boris, thanks for joining me on the observatory. Thanks and, for having uh, me. Thanks everyone for watching, and we'll see you again on the next one. Bye.